Hello and good morning, Vinny. How are you doing? Good morning, Ara. How's it going? Oh, I love your energy. Dude, I'll tell you what. I, I love Accomplice to Murder because... Every single time I see an episode, I'm always reminded of of Ray Carruth from the Carolina Panthers. He didn't commit the crime, but he was part of the crime. And I think that you really do shine the light on the team that it takes to do with the crime. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that case, by the way, uh, Ray Carruth, that's, that was my first <gasps> trial for Court TV that I went to. I had just signed on with Court TV, and they sent me down there to... Um, to learn how to be a court TV correspondent. And I, and I went down to that case and that's true. Ray Carruth um, obviously didn't pull the trigger, um, but arguably more responsible um, for what happened uh, than uh, Van Brett Watkins, uh, who I, I believe recently has passed away. Wow. Um, more responsible than Van Brett Watkins, who does, who does squeeze the trigger. Um, but obviously, um, sometimes um, the jury doesn't see it exactly that way. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with situations like that? Because, I mean, when you dig in to get these stories for accomplice to murder, I mean, you, you've you got to be able to, I always call it listening beyond sound. You've got to go beyond what we think we know. Yeah, and, and these are cases that have gone to trial, right? So uh, the purpose of a trial is to seek the truth and seek justice. And what's interesting in, in taking a look at these cases, because the trials have already happened, is we're going beyond the trial as well. Because certain things and developments have happened since the jury heard the cases. And how does that impact the way we see um, the accomplice's role? How does it impact the way we see what actually happened here and what is justice in this case? So I, I think part of what we do with accomplice to murder is obviously go back, watch the trials again, listen yeah. to the testimony. Um, but then we track down people who were connected to the case, find out what has happened since. And in some of these cases, some of these trials, there have been drastic, drastic developments, uh, much like the developments in, in the staircase. Anyone that's covered the case of Michael Peterson mm -hmm. through the years knows that um, since that trial happened, there have been many, many twists and turns. And uh, that's what we have to take a look at and take a listen to and try to present that in a way where at the end of the hour, uh, you look at, at what happened here and you think to yourself, you know, um, was justice served? And in some of these cases in, in this season, season two, you're wondering, wait a minute, mm -hmm. who exactly was the accomplice in this case? And um, to me, that's the fascinating part of, of taking a, another look at all these stories. I would love to see your notepad because you, you're a defragger. You like to break stuff down. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting because I'm, I'm covering ongoing stories on my live show every night on Court TV. Um, but for this series, um, you know, you can take a break from the ongoing and you have an opportunity uh, to take an even deeper dive into it all. Mm -hmm. And, and take a look at um, what happened here. And as I listen to some of the testimony from trials, some of these trials I covered when they first happened, um, and, and re-listening to the testimony uh, in light of more recent developments sheds a whole nother layer of intrigue on the case for me. And that's what we try to bring out e each and every week. And interviewing people, um, having more knowledge of the case it becomes a much different interview. What is that like for you when you're part of the original case and then you go back to it? I mean, that sounds like what radio people do when they listen to their air checks. They go back and go, oh my God, I didn't even know I even said that. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, and, and in, in a few of these cases, you know, your perception or, or the way you understand a story becomes much different. And for me, I'm a former prosecutor, so I I am very transparent with my viewers each and every night that that's the way I see the world. That's obviously the way I see these cases and these trials is through the filter uh, of a prosecutor. Um, that doesn't mean I think everyone's guilty. It's it's I look at these, these cases and I say, okay, uh, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence beyond mm -hmm. a reasonable doubt? Where is the truth in the case? Because that is the obligation of a prosecutor to seek the truth. So that's the way I approach everything. Um, it's not about win-loss, it's about finding out the truth and in some of these developments of cases after the trial that becomes the challenge now where where does the truth lie um did the jury 
tell us the truth about what happened here, or if we learned something since the trial that perhaps changes what really happened. So um, to me, I'm always looking for the truth, always looking for the truth, even in a case uh, where the jury has already rendered a verdict, which is the, the story in each of our episodes of Accomplice to Murder. But you know how the past is. We can all we all think we know the story, but then we bend the story. I mean, that's the way I feel when it when it comes to getting court records. When when you know we got that court recorder, you know, putting everything down. What is your interpretation today versus what was your interpretation when it was actually happening? Do you have to face that wall? Absolutely, wow. absolutely. You know. Um, I'll give you an example that I think a lot of people can relate to, which is uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. A lot of people have been talking about it recently since O.J. Simpson uh, passed away. And, and, you know, people were convinced O.J. Simpson was guilty. People didn't understand uh, the jury's verdict in that case. Um, At the time, I didn't understand the jury's uh, verdict in that case. But then I looked at the trial again. I listened to the evidence. And then um, there were just a couple of of short lines of testimony to me that told the whole story there. Mark Furman, lead investigator of the case, was asked on the witness stand, did you plant any evidence in this case? He turned to his attorney and then turned back um, to the jury and answered the question and said, on the advice of counsel, I am exercising my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Mm. Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a minute. Hold the press. Like, if you take that piece of evidence and put it into any trial that we are covering at Court TV, I could tell you exactly what the verdict will be in that trial. It'll be not guilty if the lead investigator will not tell you that he or she did not plant evidence in this case and is remaining silent on that issue, how on earth could you ever convict someone? Yeah. So, you know, that's, I think it's an an example a lot of people could understand. Um, But that's the process, right? When you go back and you listen to it, as opposed to the moment that you're living in it, where you may have um, a, a strong view of the case, a strong view of some of the evidence in the case, but there can be something like that. And then you say, of course, a jury is gonna say not guilty very quickly. If your lead investigator yep. cannot look me in the eye and tell me that they didn't plant evidence <laughs> in this case, <laughs> come on. <laughs> You know, in your own little creative way, it's like you're a professor of law. And I, I, I can't wait to hear from a lawyer or a judge that got into the industry of law because of the, of the way that you break it down and you give it a different look. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I lived it in the courtroom, um, but now I've also lived it for 20 years covering the biggest trials in the nation. And that gives me a, a very unique perspective as well, because I've seen... Um, some of the greatest uh, lawyering, some of the worst lawyering, but I've seen it all on the on these very high profile stages. Um, I've spoken to so many jurors after these cases and trying to get into their shoes. But I'll tell you something else that recently happened in my life um, that has impacted the way I see cases is I got one of those notices in the mail and I went down to the courthouse and I actually got picked to sit <laughs> on a jury. Now, it wasn't a criminal case, but it was it was a civil case. Um, but when you sit in the box, yep. that is the one place where I've never, ever sat in a courtroom before. Wow. It is so different. Um, understanding the juror experience and understanding the juror perspective. And, and the thing I took away from it was the emotional connection to the witnesses who are testifying in a case. Wow. Wow. The emotional connection. Like these are people I don't know. Um, these are people that I've never met before, uh, but you get to know them because you're in the courtroom with them. And in the jury box, you're right next to them. And, and they tell their stories and you get an emotional connection to them. And that to me, my case was a medical malpractice case. Wow. So uh, the patient testified and the doctor testified. And in both scenarios, uh, I came away with it that I absolutely felt 
horrible for the patient, the plaintiff in the case, yeah. and what had happened to him and what his life had turned into. On the other hand, I was absolutely floored um, by this doctor and like, like, like almost in awe of what he did day in and day out. He was a hand surgeon and understanding his perspective. Now, ultimately, I was an alternate, so I did not get to deliberate with my fellow jurors. Um, so I didn't get that experience. But um, to me, it was much, much more real than any case I had ever covered in my life. And I've been there. I've been there as a prosecutor. I've been there in the front row in the gallery watching these cases. But in the jury box, much different. And it now gives me a different perspective in understanding and analyzing cases going forward. See, I love that story. And the reason why is because with you being on court TV, you envision the viewer. And in that courtroom, it's still a performance. You envision the action or the reaction. You being in that in that juror seat, my God, you were with real people. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And I'll, and I'll tell you what, the other thing is, uh, my fellow jurors, I didn't get to, to deliberate with them. Um, but man, did they take their responsibilities um, seriously? None of us talked about the case when we would take those breaks. We would talk about lunch. <laughs> we would talk about each other's lives. We'd talk about, okay, where are you going to get your Uber picked up? You know, to get picked up <laughs> after court. Where are you parking? I mean, all of those things you are talking about day in and day out um, during the course of the trial, but you're following the judge's instructions. But each of us, like are just waiting for the moment that we can talk about the case with our fellow jurors. And I never got to. <laughs> wow. When you go into these cases and some of them dating back three decades to get people to talk, is it, is it an automatic yes? Or do you have to use the power of negotiation? Oh, it's not automatic. Yes. There's some people who absolutely want to talk in, in some cases it's, it's people who are behind bars and they're, you know, it's been decades and no one is talking about their cases and they want their story heard. Um, so in those cases, it's surprisingly easy to get them to speak. The difficulty is, is the logistic part of getting uh, permission to get the interview done. That's on, on one hand. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, there are some people who want to put everything behind them. People who either weren't convicted, maybe were witnesses to this, um, perhaps maybe served some time and have gotten out. Uh, they want nothing to do with you. Um, but there are others who you talk to them, you understand, you have to explain what the show is about. Yep. You explain the perspective and some of them will come forward. Uh, but each case is very, very unique. Each person involved is very unique. But there are some who have left town, have left that life mm. and don't ever want to turn back. And, and you have to respect that. You, you have to respect that. Um, uh, but that's but that I think that's part of the story that you tell is that this person, you know, who was in the middle of all this um, didn't want to speak with us. They moved on. We we respect their privacy. We don't tell viewers where they live now. Um, we will just let them live their lives. Um, but if there are people who want to tell their story, we will absolutely let them. Do you think that the definition of accomplice has changed? And the reason why I bring that up is because uh, uh, the child goes in, shoots up a school. The parents are now in prison. Yeah, that that trial um, out of uh, uh, the Oxford school shooting yeah. case, that was, yeah, we're, we're, we're prosecutors. Um, and I, I think our entire system of justice is trying to figure out a way um, to better handle and deal with uh, uh, school shooting cases, right? Um, you know, there. I think there are some solutions out there that are very obvious, like security at a school, make it the same as the security at, at every courthouse in the country. Yes. Okay. If we did that, then our schools would be safe. Uh, people aren't talking about that. I don't know why. Um, for, for this prosecutor, um, you know, what are the lines of defenses? The lines of defenses are who are the people closest to the uh, potential shooter, um, mom and dad at home. Um, and, and this, that case, I think that the, this, this factual scenario um, was, you know, over the top. How much, how much of an opportunity they had, how much um, information they did not reveal, and how little um, they cared for their child um, in dealing with his issues. So I think the, the combination there was important. But that message was heard loud and clear. So I think you will see other prosecutors extend 
um, that liability to parents in a much different way than they ever did before because of that case. So hopefully, though, it, it, it has the impact of parents being much more connected yep. to their children, parents locking away weapons much more securely, and parents understanding um, what's going on in their child's life. So hopefully it has that impact. So it 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 has the um, impact of preventing these tragedies rather than just prosecuting people after the fact. With everything that you do on court TV, especially accomplice to murder, I mean, the way there's got to be somebody knocking on your heart at all times. Um, the case, you have to have a way to um, <clears throat> disconnect for periods of time, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm, I'm able to do that in my life, whether it's... Um, but there is some interaction because... Um, sometimes the issues involve, um, you know, parents and children and the issues you see, um, maybe you become more aware of in your own life, potential issues. So it, it, it's always there. Um, but I think disconnecting work and home work from play is something you have to be able to do. Um, and I do that, you know, I love sports. So whether it's watching sports, playing sports, engaging in sports, um, to me, I can completely disconnect. Although you'll bump into people <laughs> on a pickleball court and say, "Hey, <laughs> you look familiar," and and you tell them you know who you are and what you do. Um, and also in your home life, you have to be able uh, to make that disconnect. And I think the way when you go to work for me, it's about two things: it's about uh, seeking the truth of what happened, and it's also about giving victims a voice. And if I continue to keep that as my focus. Um, I continue to keep a reason to, to keep doing what I'm doing. Wow. Vinny, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thanks so much, Arrow. I appreciate it. Well, no, thank you for what you do because you've turned every one of us into these, these geniuses of Angela Lansbury. <laughs> <laughs> you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you so much.